Can you hear me? You can. Before anything else, I would like, first of all, to offer many thanks to ETA, ETH Zürich and to the Swiss Pro Helvetia and to Hans Ulrich Obrist for having had the inspiration and the generosity to realize this exhibition. And also to Samantha Hardingham, who's not here yet, but will be here, I hope, later, for sparing some time from writing what is going to be a wonderful, complete book about Cedric's work, which will be published in December. That's a little plug. And also to Lorenza and Lorraine and Giada and hundreds of others. So many thanks to all of you for making such a delight possible. Delight was one of Cedric's favorite commodities. I have to admit that it is a little strange to find Cedric here housed in the Swiss pavilion, but as it says in the Bible, no prophet is without honor save in his own country. Although in fact, I think if he had to choose another pavilion than the British pavilion to be in, Cedric, who was obsessed with time and architecture, might well have found a comfortable home here with the Swiss because they are acknowledged to be the timekeepers of the world. Some of us who know Cedric often find ourselves asking, what would Cedric think of this? I think it would give him great delight and that would, it would make him laugh a great deal. But I think he would be laughing even more uproariously to look down and see me here talking to all of you because I am not now and never have been an architect and the profession that I belong to has um, and have done for a very long time is very, very different from Cedric's profession. And being here in Venice, I can't help but be reminded that it's a profession that was brought to great heights of distinction by an Italian whose ancestors came from this very region, the Veneto, one of the great actresses of all time, Eleonora Duse. I hope you will forgive me for dwelling on this point, but I feel that it's important that in that modern phrase, you know where I'm coming from, so that you will understand that although my view of Cedric may be pretty comprehensive, my view of architecture is relatively uninformed and perhaps particular. It's a sort of side view out of the corner of my eye, so to speak. A view, as it were, from the wings. Una vista di dietro le quinte. The truth is that Cedric and I had very little in common, apart from being freelance and knowing the meaning of the word vicissitude. We met in 1970 at a party given in London for the great Chicago broadcaster writer and humanitarian Studs Terkel. And our love and esteem for Studs was another thing that we did share. So there we were, an architect and an actress. And this association may have contributed to one of many myths and rumors that surrounded Cedric. Uh, and it's about these myths that I would like to talk a little this morning. One of the least of them was this one that I'm touching on now, the myth that Cedric had a passionate love for the theater. But the fact is that far from loving the theater, he tended to dismiss it out of hand. He once defined theater to me as a lot of people sitting facing the same direction, watching a foregone conclusion. Of course, the Fun Palace, which was one of his most famous projects, and which is one theme of the pavilion exhibition, predated our meeting. But I imagine that one reason that he found his co-creator, Joan Littlewood's ideas so stimulating and engaging was precisely that she also found almost all theater, certainly in England, both predictable and deathly boring. She wanted to change all that, and Cedric was willing to help. If anything did appeal to him about the theater, it would have been his short li its short lifespan, its uh, what you might call self-perpetuating temporariness. As I'm sure you know, and it's also been referred to, um, 
I can't remember if it was Tino or... Um, as, um, the subject was not what much of a one for what are called landmark or signature buildings. His great preference was for what he called short life buildings, put up on sites that were not available for very long. And he quite liked it if they were no more than three stories high. And it was this approach of his representing, as it seemed to do, an apparent lack of proper architectural ambition, which gave rise to another of the myths about him, one which I'll come to in a moment. Myths, as you know, I'm sure, can be traditional stories that explain some natural or social phenomenon, typically involving some supernatural beings or events. But they can also be widely held false beliefs. Cedric was a very diverse and colorful personality. And rumors and myths fluttered about him like moths during his lifetime, and they still do. Some of these, though, I think are worth dispelling or trying to dispel. For instance, there exists in England a certain ubiqu ubiquitous brand of household candle, Price's Candles. This prompted a casual comment from a fellow architect. He suggested that Cedric was the heir to a supposed enormous candle fortune. This, for some people, provided a welcome explanation, not only of Cedric's great liberality and generous lifestyle, but also of his attitude to his job. It gave rise, unfortunately, to the unhelpful myth that Cedric had a private income. And this suggestion, in its turn, allowed people who were not paying attention to view him too often, really, as, well, rather less than serious, a dilettante. For how else could you explain the fact that he was quite capable of, of telling a prospective client such as the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, that the answer to their particular problem was that they should not build not there anyway, not on the site that they were proposing to build, because that site would be totally unsuitable for their needs. They should look for another site altogether. Only after the BBC had paid millions to a more, shall we say, accommodating practitioner, did it turn out that the site was in fact totally unsuitable for their needs. The scheme of the accommodating practitioner had to be put to one side and the BBC had to look for another site altogether. And another time, in a competition to determine the fate of some old warehouses, he suggested to the good people of Hamburg that they didn't need more fashionable offices and plush apartments in refurbished warehouses and that while they were considering what the city really did need, it would be much better to create the beginnings of a bird sanctuary, such as we have here, the rescuing of small birds fallen from their nests. And this sanctuary would be one that every citizen and a lot of endangered migrating birds could appreciate. There are many other examples which illustrate the, this approach of Cedric's, a side of him which I think would have appealed to Lucius Burkhardt, um, with whom Cedric shares the great honours of this Swiss Pavilion exhibition. Somewhere, um, Burkhardt once asked, when it comes to solving problems, what does the apple tree propose when someone presents it with a problem? Apples, of course. And so, he said, the designer or architect will always propose a building. Every problem leads to a building for an architect? Well, it does depend a little on the architect. I think that in some circumstances, Cedric would have been quite capable of proposing not a building, but an apple. In other words, he would have been an apple tree after Lucius Burkhardt's heart. He, he did, in fact, once suggest to a couple who wanted him to build a house for them, that perhaps it was not a house that they needed, but a divorce. Cedric did often fail to assume that whatever the question, 
Um, whatever the question, a building was not inevitably the solution. And this fact, coupled with the sorry one that so few of his projects actually ever were realized, among those the aviary and the interaction center, not to mention the fun palace, contributed to another of our myths. And this is more serious, I feel. It was the idea that after all, Cedric didn't really want to build. He wasn't really all that interested in building. Ideas were his thing. That is so very far from true. There was nothing he loved more than being on site. I did once hear him, as he was going out of the door one day, say rather wistfully and half to himself, I miss the smell of wet concrete. And two other myths about Cedric are worth mentioning and worth squashing, and they hang together a little bit. One was that he had no sense of or respect for the past. When he was asked about certain cherished English monuments, such as the York Minster or the Nash Terraces in, in Regent's Park, pull them down, he would cry. Pull them down? Good Lord, the world would cry back. He has no sense of history. But I bet there were very few of his profession with a greater knowledge of history and of architectural history in particular. He simply didn't believe that the past should be allowed to go unchallenged and to act as a break when it came to progress. Not progress for its own sake, but progress for the sake of the community's well-being. He believed people should be given the chance to think again, often. Another sad and, to my mind, totally mythical deficiency was said to be Cedric's lack of a visual sense the notion that he didn't care much about the way things looked. Well, again, how very far from true. Look at the aviary, one of the most beautiful buildings I think I've ever seen. The, this exhibition has images from, that go back, right back to Cedric's early school days and student days at Cambridge and at the AA, as well as projects from the archive of the CCA which holds almost all the professional work produced by Cedric's office. And you can see for yourselves the evidence of his astonishing eye as it developed and refined over time. I think that when Cedric seemed to others to be ignoring the visual, it was because he had decided that in this particular instance, whatever the project happened to be, it was irrelevant or distracting. Well, so much for the myths, but the myths were often compl complicated by what you might call Cedric's departure from perceived norms. Apart from the necessary professional societies, consider some of the less obvious societies that Cedric belonged to. The Royal Aeronautical Society, the Royal Agricultural Society. Every July, we would go to the Royal Show it's the major agricultural event of the year. Fascinating, fabulous, and it was full of farm machinery, plows and com combine harvesters, with judging of cattle and shire horses, and tractor pulling competitions, building of dry stone walls, laying of hedges. He always used to say that farms were the dirtiest shop floor in England. And the Royal Show took place in fields near the village of Stoneleigh in Warwickshire. He often used to name that site, these fields, uh, when he was asked what was his favorite town. He just loved the fact that it sprang up every year, fully formed, lasted a few weeks, was pulled down and was no more, demolished. And indeed, Cedric must have been one of very few, if not the only architect, to be a member of the National Federation of Demolition Contractors. He believed that every building should have a metal plaque on it with instructions for its dismantling. This was on the principle that what goes up must come down in eventually, and you'd better get it right. Get it wrong, and when you came to take down that old skyscraper, you might have to contend with a whole lot of pre-stressed beams exploding in Midtown, in Manhattan. 
Well, he must be the only architect actually to have persuaded a group of local, local citizens not to allow the council to preserve one of his buildings. The interaction center was duly pulled down. A short life, but a happy one. Over the next 33 years, after that memorable meeting at Studs Terkel's party, I was able, tucked away there in the wings, to observe Cedric's extraordinary industry in the service of what was his true great passion, architecture. Even when his small office had no immediate client, and he did set for his clients standards at least as high as those for he, as he set for himself, another side of him that I think Lu Lucius Burkhardt would have approved, even, as I say, when there was no client but himself, he and his select shifting teams of colleagues were still hard at it. There were competitions galore, external competitions that the office went in for and internal ones set by Cedric just for the hell of it. And always a steady stream of projects of his own that were the fruit of his unceasing observation and inquiry. And as time went on, I began to realize that in all this outpouring, it was really only a handful of projects that were widely known, even though these ones were invariably referred to as iconic or influential. Projects such as the Fun, Pel Fun Palace and Pottery's Think Belt, Generator, Magnus, and so on. But I knew that these were just a tiny portion of the whole, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. The thought of an iceberg is quite refreshing in the beginnings of a Venetian summer. And thinking about it, it struck me that Cedric is one person who can bear comparison with an iceberg. They have quite a lot in common, apart simply from being quite substantial and not tolerating heat very well. I was interested to read um, that oceanographers follow icebergs because the cold, fresh water they contribute to the sea can influence currents and ocean circulation far away from their origins. Not all icebergs, but quite a lot of them, start out as part of a larger entity, a glacier, and eventually they break off, as glaciers do, and they f float their float independ independently on the high seas, great giants. The thing about glaciers, of course, is that they move extremely slowly. And if there was one thing Cedric felt strongly about, it was the fact that, much like glaciers, architecture is simply too slow. It was something he repeated over and over, one thing that he was always trying to remedy. No wonder that he often felt the urge urgently to break away. So although we, we may lament that his too, too solid flesh has melted, we have to be glad that his ideas are still afloat, still pouring out much needed freshness into the salty old oceans of architecture. Notions that Cedric was putting forward 30 years ago are taking form today. There's a great Ferris wheel on the south bank of the Thames dwarfing the Houses of Parliament, which Cedric had in a scheme 20 years before that was thought of. The Lee Valley, where the Fun Palace was to have stood to transform some sad spaces, has at long last been undergoing regeneration in the wake of the London Olymp Olympics. There's a passage that I've always loved in a work by the, the American poet Carl Sandburg called The People, Yes. In it, a woman says on board ship, isn't that an iceberg on the horizon, Captain? Yes, ma'am. What happens if we get in collision with it? The iceberg, ma'am, will move right along as though nothing had happened. And there, perhaps, the similarities must end, because Cedric was not an iceberg. If you came into collision with Cedric, it's very likely that far from sinking you, the collision would buoy you up and fill you with interest and enthusiasm. Far from doing you harm, it would be probably just the making of you. If you were to pay great attention, 
it might give you whole new and fascinating ways of looking at life. You would certainly learn a lot. And since the Swiss Pavilion, the Swiss Pro, um, Pro Elvetia, with such great generosity has, and wisdom has provided you with this splendid opportunity, I urge you as soon as you can to go and collide with Cedric in the pavilion. Thank you.